Okay, welcome everybody and Eid Mubarak. Thank you for taking the time today to, to join us to talk about these important issues. Um, I am Sonia Graham. I'm the Chief Exec of Environmental Charity Global Action Plan here in the UK. And we are hosting this event jointly with the Environment Agency to launch um, their latest State of the Environment report and discuss an important issue, how to make cities clean, green and just. I'm absolutely delighted today to be able to convene an, a panel made up of important voices from the environmental and social justice movement. And we're going to be discussing the findings of the report with this panel and Sir James Bevan, the CEO of the Environment Agency. So what are we discussing? I mean, the climate emergency is no longer a faraway problem. Um, from the extreme heat waves in Canada to flash flooding in Germany, it's been across our screens and news in the last couple of weeks. Its effects are being felt today. 80% uh, of uh, people in England, a whopping 48 million, now live in urban environments, and yet urban areas make up only 8% of the land here in England. So that's one of the most densely built up countries in Europe. So understanding the impact of environmental issues within an urban context is, is pretty critical. The panel today are going to explore how people in the UK living in towns and cities are being hit hard, not just by the environmental impacts such as air pollution, heat and floods, but also health and social inequalities. Um, for us and for me personally, um, why this report is important is because we believe that what is good for us is good for the planet and vice versa. So social injustices sit alongside the environmental crisis and neither can be solved in isolation. Through our work at Global Action Plan with schools and hospitals and communities, we see the consequences of environmental inequality play out every day. Um, and it's most stark in our work with clean air. So the worst pollution impacting those least able to protect themselves and usually those least responsible for creating the problem in the first place. So two examples of that. Um, anyone following the news of air pollution knows Eli Kisidebra, a name that's become synonymous with the tragic effects of air pollution. Ella died only eight years old after a severe asthma attack and she'd been out of hospital, in and out of hospital most of her short life. Her death certificate says air pollution and that is something we can prevent. And this is not an isolated case. Um, we recently spoke to a pregnant woman from Tower Hamlets and she was told to stop smoking by her midwife and she had never smoked. She like 95% of the residents in Tower Hamlets does not drive a car, but she's suffering the impacts of poor air as a result of the many who do. So these are incredibly important far reaching issues and I look forward to hearing more about them today from our panelists. Right, um, before we turn our minds to addressing these inequalities and hearing from Sir James Bevan, we're going to quickly go through some housekeeping. For the tweeters, um, you'll have noticed there is a snappy hashtag um, that is on screen or will be on screen, and that is um, hash state of the urban environment. Um, we are running this as a normal Zoom meeting rather than a webinar, and that's so that we can have some good meaty discussions later on in breakout groups. Um, and that's why everyone is muted until that happens. Um, if you are currently seeing hundreds of faces in gallery view, and I'm a tiny little speck on your screen, I'd recommend that you select speaker view. So at the top right of your screen, there's an icon saying view. It'll look like a little matrix. Click on that and choose speaker view. And that means that you'll be able to see the person who's speaking in, in a bigger space rather than many, many, many um, people here today. Um, we are using Slido to manage the Q&A. So you can see that on screen, there's a QR code there and there's a code to enter into Slido. So in your browse, browser, go to sli.do um, and you can put any questions you have for the panelists, for Sir James Bevan. Um, if you need technical help, you can put that there too. Um, and as you see questions go into it, if there are ones that you particularly want to hear the answers of, please upvote them. And we'll be focusing on those that are most um, voted for in the Q&A later on. If you would like subtitles, you can turn these on. Um, it is automatic transcription, so they can be a little bit hilarious. Um, you just need to go to the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you can turn them on. And in terms of running order, we're first going to hear from Sir James, then we're going to have some short presentations from our fantastic panellists. We're going to have a Q&A at around 11.45. And then finally, we're going to finish up with some small group discussions to unpack some of the topics that we've heard about. Now, to the main event. So please can we welcome Sir James Bevan, Chief Executive of the Environment Agency. Sir James. Well, thanks, Sonia. Good morning, everybody. And thanks for being here. And thank you to all of you for having me. I want to start by um, taking you all back to 2007, which was a moment when the world 
passed a little notice, but rather critical landmark. It was the point at which, uh, for the first time ever in history, uh, more humans were living in towns and cities than were living in the countryside. And as you just said, uh, Sonia, um, in England, 80% of us now live in urban areas and uh, the populations of many of our towns and cities have doubled uh, over the past 20 years. So both uh, the urban environments in England and the urban populations are continuing to grow. Now, uh, I'm here to tell you that cities are good things. Uh, they're more efficient at using resources. So they're a critical ingredient in uh, a sustainable economy. Um, they put out less carbon per person than rural areas, so they're critical in tackling climate change. Uh, they're centres of economic activity, knowledge, innovation. Uh, they produce most of the resources we actually need to create the cleaner, greener world that we all want. Uh, and they offer opportunities that uh, can be harder and impossible to access in many rural environments. So it, it's not for nothing um, that uh, the word civilization comes from the Latin for city. Uh, what that means is what I think we want in future is not fewer cities, but cities. Um, ones that use resources much more efficiently, uh, that create much less pollution, uh, that have more green uh, and blue spaces, um, so that our cities are a joy to live in for everybody. Um, in short, what we need is to make our cities what the um, UN Sustainable Development Goals already say they should be, um, which is inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. Uh, now let me start with some good news, um, uh, which does feature in the report that we're launching today uh, on uh, the state of the urban environment, um, which is that in many respects, uh, the, the environment in our cities is much better um, than it was 50 years ago. Uh, cities are much better at recycling, um, at reusing the waste they create, rather than just dumping it in rivers uh, or landfill. Um, urban air uh, is far cleaner. Uh, now than it was. Uh, that's due to better regulation, better legislation, better technology. Uh, the water's cleaner. Um, uh, the Industrial Revolution turned most of the rivers in our cities black. Uh, it killed off most of their wildlife. Uh, if you look in most urban rivers now, they're blue again uh, and uh, trout have uh, come back. Uh, there's more surprisingly large parts of our cities um, are not uh, concrete, uh, but grass. Um, what's called natural land cover. Uh, makes up about 30% uh, of the urban area um, in England. Uh, and those green spaces, uh, you know, grassland, parks, allotments, public gardens, uh, they're not just places for um, those of us who live in cities to play or relax uh, or enjoy nature. Um, they also have massive uh, practical benefits. Um, so they remove air pollution, they reduce noise, they provide habitat for wildlife, they support biodiversity, they absorb and store carbon, they keep our cities cool, uh, they reduce flood risk, uh, they support the local economy by attracting customers and investors, uh, they uh, provide a greater sense of place, they foster social cohesion, uh, and partly by providing opportunities for, regulate, for recreation, but mostly just because they exist. Um, those green and blue spaces in our cities, they improve people's mental and physical well-being. So for the amount of good that they do, um, there is literally nothing uh, in a city that beats a good green or blue space. Uh, that's the good news. What's the bad news? Um, well, um, we shouldn't overdo uh, the celebration because much of that progress has stalled in the last decade. Uh, and we have some very big uh, challenges uh, remaining. Um, you mentioned uh, in your introduction, Sonia, air pollution. Uh, it's still uh, in our cities exceeding World Health Organization guidelines. Uh, the quality of the water uh, in our urban rivers is under new pressure uh, from pollutants, from population growth and the climate emergency. Uh, and the amount of green space in our cities is actually going down. Uh, it gets worse. Um, whether you are benefiting from the green and blue space that does exist in our cities depends largely on who you are uh, and where you live. Uh, and the fact is that deprived communities have much less access. So many city dwellers don't live within easy walking distance of a park or a playing field or a garden or another green space. And those who do tend to be the rich ones. 59% uh, of uh, rich households, so those are those in the top 10% income bracket, are within a 10 minute walk uh, of a publicly accessible green space. Uh, that compares with only 35% uh, of households in the bottom 10% income bracket. Uh, Moreover, the quality of that green space, of those parks, those rivers, uh, is often lower in deprived areas, which mean people will visit them less often and will derive less benefit from them. 
uh, and there are racial disparities too. So city communities with 40% or more residents from minority ethnic backgrounds have access to 11 times less green space uh, locally than those communities that comprise mainly white residents. Now, I don't think we should be surprised that the benefits of city living are not equitably shared. They never have been since cities were invented about 5,000 years ago. Um, you know, having money gives people the power to choose where they live. And if people have choice, uh, most people would prefer to live in clean and green environments. But the disadvantages that poor urban communities now suffer are not just lack of access to good green and blue space. Um, because in modern cities, poorer communities also have higher exposure to things like air pollution, flood risk, uh, poor water quality in rivers, and to the smell and the noise and all the other uh, damage that comes from industrial facilities uh, or waste sites. So poorer urban communities are not just disadvantaged economically, though they are, they are also disadvantaged environmentally. Uh, and because of the strong link between your environment and your health, that means that poorer communities are also disadvantaged in health terms too. And there is a clear correlation uh, between life expectancy in the least and most deprived uh, areas uh, of the country. Now, uh, most of those inequalities are being made worse by the climate emergency because it's bringing more extreme weather, more damage to the environment, and so more harm to people's health. Uh, we know that in developing countries where I spent most, much of my career, uh, climate change does most damage to the most vulnerable and because they have the least capacity to adapt to its consequences. We also know uh, that the most vulnerable people uh, are the people who bear the least responsibility for causing the problem of climate change in the first place. And the fact is that a similar injustice is happening here. So deprived communities in this country who have smaller carbon footprints and pollute less than wealthier communities tend to live in areas of higher pollution which are less resilient to the effects of climate change. So uh, we're not where any of us wants to be. Uh, what do we do? How do we then create cities that are genuinely uh, inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable? Answer, we need to clean up, we need to green up and we need to level up. So what do I mean by clean up? Well, um, while our towns and cities are much cleaner than they were, there's a lot more to do to improve air quality, to stop river pollution, to tackle waste sites and remediate land contaminated by industrial use. Uh, now, the responsibility of pollution and for making sure it doesn't happen lies with those who pollute. But the Environment Agency, uh, like others, is playing its part in tackling all those issues. I think we also need to green up, by which I mean um, uh, not just creating more and better green and blue spaces in our cities. Uh, it doesn't just have to mean um, parks or public gardens. Uh, often the best of those green and blue spaces and the ones that benefit the most deprived communities the most are part of something else and they do many things at once so for example uh, planting grass on rooftops creating ponds on small patches of grass between buildings planting trees in the right place uh, all those things help reduce flooding uh, improve water quality enhance biodiversity and create wider benefits for people who live nearby um, so more green and blue space uh, in our cities would provide many benefits for those who live there it would also help the nation's economy. Uh, it would help the nation's health uh, because we know that the NHS could save over two billion pounds, billion in treatment costs if everybody in England had equal access to good quality green space. Uh, and that green and blue space uh, would help the planet too because as I've said, greener cities put out less carbon so that would tackle the climate emergency. Greener cities have more wildlife so we can tackle the biodiversity crisis uh, as well. Uh, leveling up, uh, I think the government's right uh, to be focusing on that, uh, but I've, as I'm trying to uh, illustrate, uh, the inequalities in this country are not just economic. Um, so we need to level up uh, the environment so that it's better for everybody, rich and poor, black and white, um, just as we level up um, the economy. And they're linked. Um, investing in a better environment uh, will also create uh, jobs and growth. Finally, I want to talk a bit about how we do this, because I think it's as important as what we do. I do think it's critical that people like us in the Environment Agency and other organisations represented here today make sure that they pay full attention to fixing the problems where poorer urban communities live, because frankly, those problems tend to be worse and more harmful, and that we don't just get drawn into focusing on the areas which are better off and better able to lobby us uh, and the authorities. 
Uh, we need to be, my organisation needs to be the environment agency for everyone uh, in this country, not just for some. We can only create the better places for local people we want if we actually listen uh, to what people want rather than simply impose what we think is the right answer. And we try to do a lot of listening ourselves. But I also think um, that, that the Environment Agency is not yet um, listening as hard as we could or should to poorer, disadvantaged or ethnic minority communities, nor, and this is part of the problem, do I think that we're yet doing well enough in recruiting, in retaining and promoting staff from those communities uh, in our organisation. Uh, we're not alone in that. We know uh, from the 2017 report that the uh, environment sector is the second least ethnically diverse sector in England after farming, but frankly, that doesn't make it any better. Um, uh, I think we in the Environment Agency and everyone in the environment sector need to show that we value workforce diversity as much as we value biodiversity. Uh, we're trying to do something about this in the Environment Agency. We're seeking to ensure that we do understand better the environmental threats that affect disadvantaged communities, and today's report is part of that. Uh, we're trying to build stronger partnerships with uh, those communities. Um, and we're working to recruit more staff ourselves from uh, urban communities, from disadvantaged backgrounds, from ethnic communities and so on, so that we, that we better represent, uh, better understand and better serve the whole of modern Britain. Now, um, that's, that's about 2000 words, uh, but I will stop uh, and sum up uh, what I'm trying to say in just six, if I may. Um, if you really want me to uh, summarize how our future uh, cities should be, it would be, green and blue and just too. Thank you, back to you, Sonia. Thank you, James. Um, two billion for the NHS, that's quite a, quite a number. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we're now going to turn to three community NGO speakers to get their perspectives and, and their response to Sir James's speech. Um, so first up, we have Judy Ling Wong, CBE. She is a painter, a poet, and environmental activist, uh, but today she's speaking as Honorary President of the Black Environmental Network. So please can we have some raucous muted clapping for Judy. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you all. The way I work is I put a lot of text on some of my slides as notes for you, so you do not need to take notes. I will also pick out key points for this five minute talk. So do not try to read everything, just listen and enjoy the talk. You're welcome to have the PowerPoint. First of all, I would like to welcome the report, especially in the context of highlighting the need to adjust inequalities and address them with a focus on the urban environment. Globally, we live in an urbanizing world. In 2017, the UN Deputy Secretary General at a high level meeting at UN Habitat linked environmental policy to human settlements. She said, the battle for sustainability will be won or lost in cities. Urban communities are where multicultural communities are. The lived experience of multicultural communities are multi-layered. We tend to live in more polluted areas where there's less green spaces and amenities with poorer housing conditions. Often our jobs expose us to additional stresses such as having no daylight during working hours in the London underground or shift work with unsocial hours. We're overrepresented in poorly paid jobs for example, as carers and cleaners. This is combined with a vital element that injures the immune system, stress and fear from the abuse on the basis of race, belief systems and culture to being seen as lesser, struggling against the inequality of opportunity when someone good enough is never promoted. This is the Ben challenge. This is combined with the whole fact that unless we do something in shifting our thinking, nothing will happen. There is no such thing as a purely environmental initiative. A so-called purely environmental initiative is one that has rejected its social, cultural and economic dimensions. Now I would like to move very quickly 
onto examples and actions. There's so many good examples. We need to replicate in them by the thousand. There's a lot of goodwill, but it's only when goodwill translates into action that it becomes powerful. As I said, I will highlight key points and leave you with very obvious lists on the PowerPoint that you're welcome to have. So representation, affected communities should lead. And I'll leave you with these notes. Do Google Climate Reframe. We're not at square one, you know, an open database that everyone can use to find multicultural activists and experts is a great model. We need a lot more of this. This is a city-based action from Bradford that recognizes people's presence and expresses it through, it through cultural features in a popular park. This promotes a tremendous sense of belonging. Doing anything that counters negativity is really good for us. Engagement, more notes for you. We benefit, but we also contribute. And here we see that London National Park City is such a wonderful example of using a website to stimulate actions and build capacity, a grassroots movement that is doing such a lot for us. Another wonderful example is Think Can Do. Every borough should have a community space that links straight into local power and resources with their council. And citizens have agency. Ordinary people did this, no project money involved, which everyone will be happy to know, with little prospect of substantial space for new green spaces. Transforming streets is one of the ways to go. Let people do more. Let them own the pavements, plant things, put posts on pavements. All this can be achieved as long as a buggy or a wheelchair can get through. We are all happy. And provision, more notes for you on environmental improvement, information and green jobs. A model multi-use space is wonderful. Here you learn about nature, connect with it, but have all kinds of things like the best BMX track in the whole of Europe, serving the largest just housing estate in the whole of Europe too, and becoming their backyard. Here is an obvious thing. Schools are where children spend most of their time and outdoor learning can give them a foundation for life connecting to nature and contributing to nature. Trips, of course, is another thing. We can't be prisoners in the landscape of the urban cities. We need to know nature at large and knowing it inspires us to do things in a very, very different way to enrich our, nature, our future. So working towards net zero, the green jobs movement is on stream. Government is intending to create 2 million green jobs. So this is time to let them know what you want in terms of the types of green jobs. And of course, also the new apprenticeships with the, the, this is something that I chair and I want to hear from you. As for COP26, Ethnic minorities are local and global people, and we want people-centered policy in an urbanizing world. All we do is set within national and international frameworks as, as policy. And the most powerful thing to serve us is people-centered policy in an urbanizing world. So let's work together to build an equal and inclusive world in which people and nature thrive together. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Judy. Uh, and I'm still amazed at the number of slides you got through there in, in under five minutes, so quite incredible. Um, and I love the positivity there of the routes to start addressing some of the inequalities that we've been talking about. Uh, just a reminder to everyone listening in, please do go to Slido and, and put your questions in for our speakers as we go. Right, our next fantastic speaker is Kate Metcalf. Um, she is the co-director of the Women's Environment Network, and she's going to talk specifically about women in the urban environment and her work. So can we have a, a muted Zoom drum roll for Kate, please? Hi, 
Hi, everybody. Thank you very much um, for inviting me to be here with you today. Um, I echo what Judy has said, really welcome this report and its focus on inequalities and levelling up. And um, just like to say, yeah, Judy is a real inspiration uh, for a lot of WEN's work. Um, and I'll hopefully keep up that upbeat message um, in, in my presentation. So just to um, tell you about when. So oops, just trying to get onto the next slide. Sorry, apologies. Um, so when um, we when supports women and the communities to take action um, on issues that connect gender, health, equality and the environment. So we don't see these as sort of separate issues. So we take a sort of intersectional feminist approach to environmental justice. Um, so we are based, uh, but we are based in East London, our office, uh, where we run sort of very practical projects um, alongside our national campaigns. And these include running a community food growing network, a food pantry, a reusable nappy scheme, as well as national campaigns such as our environmental uh, campaign championing plastic free uh, re periods and reusable period products, uh, and also our feminist Green New Deal. We kind of start with our bodies, homes and neighbourhoods, so making it really relatable to people's lives. And as Judy said, starting very much at the grassroots level and connecting that to, to global. So the next slide, I don't know why my cursor doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> Sorry. So a lot of people ask us, what's gender got to do with the climate crisis? Um, so really, we believe that we need a holistic approach to the climate crisis that centres gender, racial and social equality alongside transitioning to a net zero economy. And we really believe unless we centre those inequalities, we won't be able to effectively address the climate crisis. And I would think it's really essential to explicitly include gender equality in the levelling up agenda alongside racial and social inequality. Because we know um, globally, but also in the UK, women are disproportionately negatively affected by the climate crisis. And this is due to structural gender inequality. And again, this intersects with other forms of discrimination, such as race and disability. Um, so really what we're seeing, and we've seen with the COVID uh, crisis as well, um, it simply magnifies existing inequalities within our society. Um, women are often leading the way to net zero. Um, it's well known that governments with higher proportions of women are likely to make better decisions for the planet. Yet these experiences and priorities are often overlooked in policy decisions. Still, uh, major environmental and political decisions are overwhelmingly male um, and women's voices and people of colour's voices are muted in shaping decisions. And um, as Mary Robinson famously said, the president, um, former president of Ireland, when it's a man's world, you have male priorities. And she said also, when the problems are man-made, the solutions are feminist, which I think is a, is a good mantra. So looking at our work, we are working, sorry, I'm just trying to get to the next slide. And see. Ah, we're working on a feminist Green New Deal project with a partner, the Women's Budget Group. So the aim of this project is we believe that all women's and marginalised voices should be central to the green economy. And we want to amplify these voices through grassroots workshops with women's organisations and community organization across the UK as well as a series of policy roundtables and bringing those two different areas together uh, to have to policy makers and really when we go to Glasgow um, the COP26 platforming these voices to make sure that they are central um, to, to the vision for going forward. So really our starting point should be we don't want to exacerbate existing inequalities, we want to transform them. So we want to see a care-led recovery, 
sorry, I'm trying to get the slide thing doesn't seem to be working. Oh, here we go. So yeah, the, the main essence of a feminist Green New Deal is we want to mainstream an intersectional analysis from across the whole green economy. So bring that thinking into all areas, um, expand the care economy, um, putting the care economy central alongside technical jobs. So care jobs are green jobs. Um, putting social infrastructure at the bedrock of a decarbonized society and crucially redistribute unpaid, unpaid care work, which is a, an unfair burden on women. So we're looking at the new, the positive picture that Judy painted about lots of new green jobs, which are fantastic, but we want to ensure um, that these jobs benefit women and people of colour equally. We don't want to replicate existing um, gender and racial inequalities when we're looking at that. But equally, we would like to encourage boys and men into um, already caring green sectors that are dominated uh, by, by females. Um, so we're looking at inclusive and green public transport taking into the different needs of women who often have multiple complex journeys uh, due to caring responsibilities. And one of the key elements of this would be strengthening the bus network um, because women um, rely on buses far more than men. So bringing that, um, that approach into the planning system. Um, and when we're looking at housing, um, Again, trying to think of housing that addresses the unequal care of women, but yet also addresses environmental issues. And um, there's quite a disproportionate impact on women to housing, because women on the whole tend to be poorer, so that, that affects their access to housing. Uh, over a lifetime, 31% um, is the earning gap between women and men. So again, we've sort of, on this boiling day, uh, we're looking about housing and then the urban environment. And it, it's interesting to look back at the European heat wave of 2003. And we noticed there that female deaths were 65%. Um, so it really is a gendered impact. And it was mainly elderly women who were affected and a higher death toll for widowed, single and divorced women. And that again was linked to poverty and obviously probably to race as well. So, but at, when we like to be very practical, we've got a lot of really positive local projects happening in Tower Hamlets. We're working on um, a just food and climate transition uh, looking at a, creating a sustainable, just, healthy, women and community-led food system. Uh, and what would that mean? What would that look like? So we have very um, supporting people to get, to get engaged in environmental issues, but through a very practical way, growing food in their neighbourhoods, on their social housing estates, on their balconies, and bringing people together in that way. Um, so we also work in women's refuges, helping people to heal from domestic violence through therapeutic horticulture as well. So yeah, we really believe that local action is the way to engage people. Uh, I realize I'm, I've gone over time, so I am um, welcome any questions and I'd like to uh, thank you very much for listening. Oh, thank you so much, Kate. Um, and on the subject of elevating female voices more, James is well and truly outnumbered by fantastic ladies on the panel today. Um, our third speaker is um, Olivia Sweeney. Olivia is a black and green ambassador for Bristol, but as I found out through some stalking earlier, she's also an incredibly talented chemical engineer, voted top 100 most, most influential women in engineering a few years ago. So I guess you were hoping I wouldn't find that out, Olivia, but over to you. Thank you. With the internet, nothing is anonymous anymore, so um, I should realise these things. Um, thank you for having me and um, on an amazing panel. I feel like I should have probably spoken first because um, uh, it's hard to follow up on what has been said so far, but I will do my best to. Um, so I am Olivia uh, and I'm one of the Black and Green Ambassadors for Bristol. 
And that is a project that explores the intersection between climate and racial justice. So today I'm going to very briefly try and cover a few things. First of which is what that project is and the origins which it was born out of, which I think speaks to some of the broader issues within the environmental sector. Um, I will cover what the projects become and how we try and tackle the climate and ecological emergency in an equitable way. I'll very briefly specifically talk about my community project, which is looking at clean air, which has been touched upon by other people. So I don't want to repeat what has already been said. And then if I don't blab too much, I'll try and um, get on to some reflections from the State of the Environment report. So the Black and Green Ambassador Project was born out of a sense of frustration. In 2015, Bristol was lucky enough to be awarded the European Green Capital Year, which is a great uh, accolade and a point of celebration. Yet um, the Black and Brown community felt like they were being left out of this conversation yet again not only from the celebration and what was um, given both media coverage and financial coverage, um, but just within the conversations and the decision making and that the black green agenda wasn't being included um, within that conversation and within that celebration. Um, so the need was felt that something should be done to address that. Um, so a community conversation was held, the green and black conversation that put those two um, very specific things at the heart of the conversation. And these were some of the key takeaways that were highlighted from that conversation in 2015. And though some of these things have improved in, in six years, they're still very relevant today. So I thought it was worth highlighting those to you. Um, so a big one was language. And we all know that that is important for it to be easy and accessible. And a lot of environmental language up until this point has been quite scientific. But there's also the cultural um, element of language and the ownership. So my example there is always veganism and planet friendly or plant based diets. Why do we not use terms like Ital, which is a Jamaican vegan cuisine, quite so much? And why are these other cultural cuisines that have always been planet friendly not celebrated in the same way? And also when coming to language, things don't translate. Um, there's three ambassadors at the moment, uh, Roy and Asiya, who I'll come on to at the moment, and we're often translating things into Arabic and Somali. And there's literally not words for certain things that we're saying um, when we're trying to do that. So how are people meant to understand um, what you're talking about if the actual word <laughs> doesn't exist? Um, creating new stories was a big one. The need for... Um, the need for storytelling to be a big part of that. Um, Judy, Judy has touched upon um, how it needs to be active actions, um, not just policy, policies and leadership and decision making, which is a big part of what the this iteration of what Black and Green is about. Um, so a pilot project was born out of this. Uh, Jazz and Zakia are two amazing people. If you give their names a Google, you'll find some brilliant stuff that they have done and are still doing. Um, and a big thing that they were focused on was access to nature. So they ran um, trips out to Slimbridge, which is a wetlands place. Um, and here was some of, on the slide, you see some of the key um, barriers that were in place for people to access in this alone. But I think one of the biggest learnings from that was how simple actions can make such a big difference. So from the feedback that was given, Slimbridge changed their introduction activity to be around birds that you could spot within the Bristol local area and what their origins were around the world. So this, this spoke to people who have family and an immediate connection around the globe. And it, 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 it improved this sense of belonging that Judy was talking about where you could say, I can see this bird here, but my mum can see this bird over there in India. And that sense of the globe being local, but belonging in a city that can often feel quite overwhelming and not like it's truly for you was really important. And so the project grew. Um, and it's now much more official than it was. And I just want to highlight how important the partnership between these two um, bodies, Bristol Green Capital and Ujima Radio are. So Ujima is a local African community led radio station. So you're including community groups and established voices that are already there. And Bristol Green Capital has those traditional environmental links. So you're able to bring um, the assets of both those together and, and create stuff in a really authentic and interesting way. I'm already well over time, so I'm gonna fly through these now. Um, so black and green, um, what I think is really important here is that we were able to build our vision, mission and values together. And I think that's really important when you're talking to marginalized communities 
that quite often feel like the agenda is already set before you're even um, invited to consult. So we were able to build these together. So you can just read these off the slide. And I think these speak to how we're trying to, um, how we're trying to tackle things in an equitable way. So very briefly, the vision, the mission, and our commitment. So what we are doing now, I will very briefly highlight. Um, the individual development is a really important part of what Black and Green is about. As has been spoken about, um, leadership and decision-making needs to be uh, taken by a broader range of people. And seeing yourself in places is really important. So part of the program is about developing me as a future leader to take some of those spaces up and create those opportunities and challenge um, expectations of what somebody who works within the environmental sector looks like. But a really important part of what we're doing is also talking directly to the community. Uh, these, oh, these are the projects that we're talking to people about um, that are particular areas of interest to us. So that's my colleagues, Roy and Asiya. Um, and my project particularly focuses on clean air, but I'm not gonna talk about that because I don't have time and clean air has been covered. Um, but what I will finally say is my takeaway from the State of the Urban Environment um, report, I was really glad and, and agreed with a lot of what it was saying. And I loved the fact that environmental justice was at the, the center of what we were talking about. Um, but I think it's really important to highlight that the report talks about how vital and pivotal cities are. Um, yet large amounts of communities within the city don't feel like they have that same power um, that cities have um, as a structure to influence the green future that we're building for. So I think that is one of the crux of the things that needs to be addressed in order to create this change. And I was glad to see that resilience was on the agenda and has been spoken about by both Judy and Kate. And I think this is a vital part of what we need to be talking about in the state of the envir urban environment going forward, because the reality is that these negative environmental impacts environmental impacts are coming. We're just trying to mitigate them. So if we want to protect those marginalized communities and people that have been shut out of conversations for so long, resilience needs to be a higher priority than I feel it is right now. So that's a whistle stop tour from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olivia. And we'll make sure we get your slides up on, on our site so that people can uh, spend a bit more time going through them because some brilliant stuff on there. So thank you. Um, right, now before we move on to the Q&A, James, would you like the opportunity to reflect or respond to any of the, the comments that have been made by our speakers? Well, thanks. Very briefly then, uh, uh, Sonia. I mean, I found myself nodding along, I don't know whether you could see me, in violent agreement with all three speakers. So it's great to hear that there's such a sort of uh, collective view. Uh, 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 you know, I, there was so much there, I won't attempt to sort of summarise it, but just to react to some of it. Um, I think uh, Judy's point that um, I did write down lots of quotes, Judy, and I'll see the slides, but I did write it down as well. Um, and the one thing I wrote down in particular and underlined was the line that good health is the basis for resilience. And I think, as, as Olivia just said, resilience is going to be a massive thing for the next foreseeable future, because, you know, the way that we successfully deal with the climate emergency is both mitigating the extent of it, but becoming more resilient to the effects which are going to happen anyway. Uh, and your point, which I think came through in all three presentations, is that, you know, the least resilient are going to be uh, the people who are, you know, in some way disadvantaged, either because they're female or black or poor or we're living in a developing country. Um, so that, that, that emphasis on, on good health uh, as an investment in the resilience uh, of everyone, I thought was really important. I agree with you, Kate, on uh, the sort of intersectionality or, you know, the way I think of it is everything is connected to everything else. Um, uh, and uh, I'm struck that, um, uh, you know, uh, in my own experience, interventions that you think are fixing one problem actually fix another. So, example, I lived in India. Um, uh, a lot of what I was doing with the government was about development. The single biggest magic bullet for development that there is in the world is to educate girls. If you do nothing else, just educate girls. Um, the challenge in India was that most girls, when they reach puberty, drop out of school. Um, and uh, the, what we were doing in India was building toilets uh, in girls' schools. Now, that, that looks like an environmental intervention or a health intervention, but actually 
it's an education and development intervention because once girls have adequate toilets, they will go back to school and they get the education and everything will be will be better. So that sense from all of you that everything is connected to everything else and we need to we need to understand that in our policy interventions, I think is really, um, uh, really important. Um, uh, and um, I think finally, um, what I'm taking away from all three is a great sense of uh, agency, because I do think we're more powerful than we sometimes credit ourselves. Um, uh, a, a great sense of, of positivity. And I think, you know, we shouldn't be, um, you know, overconfident about what we can achieve. But I do think we should realise that we've made immense progress in the last few years. Uh, ultimately, you know, all these solutions uh, are political, that they're, they're about influencing politicians of whatever kind to do the kind of things that we want to do. Uh, and I think the pressure on politicians around the world to do the right thing has grown immensely over the last few years, not least down to the actions of you three and the organizations uh, that you run. Final point though, I think we should also remember that a lot of this is personal. We don't have to sit and wait, uh, you know, for Boris uh, or, or, or Biden to do something, though let's, let's urge them to do the things they need to do. In our daily lives, we can all make changes that will make the world a better place even if it's just not sort of pouring oil down the sink or flushing wet wipes down the loo. So let's remember that a lot of this is political, that it does require action at the political level, but let's, let's also take some personal responsibility for what each of us can do to make the world a better place. Thank you. Lovely, thank you, James. Um, right, so I'm gonna uh, move into the questions that are being thrown at me on the chat. Um, and we're gonna start off with those that have been sort of voted up to the top. Um, and the first one has been a request for, I suppose, examples of cities that have successfully become cleaner, greener and, and more just. So what have they done differently? And, and what examples, I suppose, can we learn on, on tackling um, environmental inequalities? So perhaps if we start there for James and then um, we'll, we'll pass over to um, Judy, would you like to respond to this one? Hi. Lovely. Okay, so very briefly, I think I think the cities that are successfully achieving these things have, have, have a few things in common around the world. And I've seen this in India and Africa as well as I've seen in Britain. Um, they are clear from the outset that this is what they want. So they're clear that, that being a cleaner, greener, uh, more just place to live is, is an objective in itself and that that's their priority. So job one, be clear about what you want and show that you care about it. The second thing that successful ones have done, this plays very much to what Olivia and, and, and others were saying, is they've included everybody. Um, they have included everyone in, in, involved, all of the people who are affected by what they want to achieve, both in the design of what's going to happen and in the delivery. It, it, it's a much more effective way of creating and delivering uh, solutions. And very few cities have actually been that inclusive uh, in the design as well as the delivery. Um, and they have sought to uh, secure, and several of you talked about this, multiple outcomes. So, you know, they haven't just built flood defences to protect communities. They've thought of those schemes as growth schemes to unlock sustainable growth, which they are, uh, as beauty schemes to make a city more beautiful, uh, as health schemes by, you know, running cycle tracks along the, along the top of the, of the defences, etc. So thinking, again, you can call it intersectionality and call it, you know, everything is connected to everything else, but thinking about the multiple effects you can have on multiple communities, they have thought about that. Uh, one example, little example, but a really powerful one I've seen, um, Slough, uh, not far from me, uh, the environment, uh, which does have a, a community that is quite disadvantaged. Um, one of the things we've done recently is work with um, a local school to um, uh, create a large um, flood uh, pond uh, in the school grounds uh, because uh, that part of Slough, Central Slough, is prone to flooding and one way to manage that flood risk is to create green spaces where the water can collect rather than going into the school or people's houses and that's a great example of the kind of thing I'm talking about so it was designed with the school kids and with the teachers uh, it's a very uh, multi-ethnic community so it's touching you know a large amount of the, of the community um, and it has multiple effects because it doesn't just uh, stop the school and the local areas uh, from flooding, though it contributes to that, uh, but it's also created for the first time in this inner city school, uh, a, a place of nature uh, where there are kind of frogs and insects and, and, and grasses and things that the kids see every day because they're it's kind of in the back backyard of the school. So that's just one very small example of how working together, you can create fantastic um, you know, effects. And most importantly, 
the environment agent didn't come along and tell the, the school what to do. The school thought of it themselves uh, and we just helped. Thank you. Thanks. And Judy, do you, do you have a, a thought on examples of where you've seen this done well? I think that the most important thing we need to notice at this present time is that there are just so many good examples of what people are doing. The problem is scaling up. I want things at scale multiplied by thousands. That's when the switching on of connections and of contribution and benefits to people all come at the same time. And when you look at some of those scaling up examples, it's important to note that they are coming from the grassroots like London National Park City, where they're really mobilizing people. I'm one of the co-founders of that. And you can see how high diversity is on the agenda for some years. And you look at the website, the images are just everywhere. People can see themselves. Seeing themselves is so important. So these things about recognizing examples and really helping people to replicate them. I mean, the thing can do in Camden is the same. That's a great example because instead of being just a group working on its own, it is an example about linking with the local council to create this group. The linking into power, now that is something we really want. So examples are not just councils as organizations like environment agency what if we had a network that linked into the environment agency and became part of this movement for inclusion and so on. that is really interesting and it moves things in a way that you cannot unless you were linked into power and resources thank you judy and actually following on from that point there's a, a question around um how can we help people have more say in changing their own streets so how can we more effectively get local authorities to allow citizens to intervene um, and contribute um, rather than jump through uh, bureaucratic hoops so um the question there i mean it might be nice to hear olivia how you've worked with bristol and, and the things that have worked well there but um also kate have you any any thoughts on this as a as a question so how do we more effectively get local authorities to allow citizens to be involved so um Black and Green Ambassadors is lucky in the fact that Bristol City Council is one of our sponsors and supporters, so they're on board from the beginning, which I appreciate isn't possible for all people, all organisations and groups, but for us, we're lucky that both the universities within Bristol, so University of Bristol and West of England and Bristol City Council are, are one of our um, sponsors, so we're in conversations with them from the beginning, so we know what is possible and what's achievable, so I think that's a big thing as well, is, is the expectations. Um, having realistic expectations and I think as much as possible it's it's having that conversation from the beginning and ex, uh, making it clear how, what all those links are and how important it is I'm a little bit of a rebel as well so sometimes I'm a little bit more asked for forgiveness as opposed to ask for permission um, but I appreciate it, that again that isn't always within people's people's um, comfort zone so I think it's all about the balance and and again Bristol is is quite progressive so we do have closed street parties that's quite quite okay around where we are so you can do that so I think um it's a combination of of bringing people along from the beginning as much as possible may that be an organization like like Bristol City Council is an organization at the end of the day and as I was saying in my talk you've got language is, is important so how you talk to Bristol City Council is different to how I'm going to talk to the people that that, that I want to what I want to bring on board so it's it's about getting that buy-in from the beginning as much as possible but realizing that the city council is the city council and accepting the limitations of what that is and then seeing if you can can work around it thank you Olivia um uh, Kate any any thoughts from your side uh, I completely agree with what Olivia has said, definitely. And I think as well, if we can sort of, a lot of local councils probably want to do it, but maybe don't know how. Um, so if we can share like really good examples where it's worked. I think that's going to inspire a lot of local authorities uh, to get on board. And uh, another problem is everyone sort of working in silos. I mean, it happens with the women's sector, the environmental sector or racial justice sector. And I think this is the time where we need to think, bring people together around a common agenda and say, look, we're, these are not separate issues. Let, let's work together. Um, I, I think... There was a really, I think Barcelona is quite a good example uh, of where they're doing really positive work in terms of local authority. And it's not by chance they've got like a feminist, openly feminist mayor 
uh, who's leading and you know creating those uh, super blocks I think that were mentioned in the report and they I suppose started from that point of consulting local people and really making sure they consulted everybody but particularly women uh, elderly people children what would how would they like their neighborhoods to be and it was interesting that one of the key things that they wanted was public toilets accessible in each sort of little street area and you might think oh that's a trivial point but it's a real gender issue uh, you know if you haven't got a public toilet a lot of women don't even go out the house older women because they're worried about a public toilet and if you've got children a lot with you caring you know having something so simple uh, as a public toilet and streets where children can play and the car doesn't dominate benefits everybody really but linking that with public transport as well so there's the safety element uh, alongside air pollute yeah I think that I suppose those conversations with local authorities you need to get the the transport planning people as well as the urban planners all together in the same room uh, with organizations that have particular expertise on that is absolutely vital um, so with that sort of mentality really um, we need to make places green but safe in terms of gender violence racial violence uh, alongside the green uh, benefits as well Thank you. And, and then in consulting and, and involving community groups, we've, we've got a question here around the role of these community groups in, in achieving a, a clean, green and just um, um, urban setting. But a comment that often these groups are mostly white and middle class. Um, so how, how do we help the community groups that are, are working to, um, to actually break out of this green bubble? Well, I think that this whole thing of examples as such a theme at the moment is really important because when you look at examples and the people doing things look exactly like you, you know, you get really switched on that if they can do it, I can do it. I'm just like them. And you can find actually among community groups and so on, really superb good practice. One is in Lambeth, Myersfield Park have just been doing a project with a really big firm Arup is really big and they happen to have a facility for research that helps community groups and it got wind of this and got them involved and they're doing a project called Lambeth Plots where they're going around doing a mapping exercise and mapping right across the borough opportunities that are interactive for people mapping every bit where you can grow food on social housing land on street corners everywhere and then they're going to overlay it with all sorts of criteria about deprivation and so on, and getting people to speak. So these experiences that allow the local community to be involved and see this is happening, run by a local group, then they too will dream up other things about what to do. This is for food growing, but I can tell you the places they're going to map, you can do wild meadow planting, you can do things for wildlife, you can do things that are just green spaces for people to enjoy because they're very beautiful. So this is going to be a great, great project that is going to switch on both community confidence and community participation for a whole range of greening for the urban areas. Thank you, Judy. Does anyone else want to respond to, to that one? Yeah, a little bit. Quickly, is that okay? Thank you. Um, I think um, there's also a point that Community groups that name themselves environmental groups are, yes, very likely to be um, white and middle class, but that doesn't mean that community groups who are interested in those things don't already exist in, in, other, in other diverse groups. So if you Google green groups in Bristol, but if you Google food groups in Bristol, if you Google something else, you'll get up a different group of people. And just because people aren't self-describing as environmentalists doesn't mean that isn't a consideration. So again, it's about not seeing things in silos and realizing that those groups exist um, already. You just, you just need to find them in a different way and appreciating that their, um, how you reach out to them is gonna be different. So for example, as much as I, I don't use my phone, um, WhatsApp is a great way for certain groups of people to communicate. They might not have a website, they might not have a Facebook page. So it's just thinking a little bit outside the box and realizing that, that the groups do already exist. It's just how you're willing to bring them on board and taking that little bit of time um, I would say is, is a big part of that. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Olivia. Right, James, I have one for you, which is, um, you mentioned the responsibility for tackling pollution lies with those who pollute. 
do you think that the laws and regulations in the UK are sufficiently robust to ensure polluters are forced to assume this responsibility? Thanks. So uh, I guess I'd say three things. One, uh, the polluter should pay, right? That's the basic principle for sort of environmental law, justice, and everything else that we want. I mean, you know, the basic principle is the polluter should not pollute. But if they do, they should pay the full costs of doing it. Uh, and at the moment, they aren't. Um, so we have had, for example, uh, you'll have read about it in the news, uh, a big court win last week against Southern Water, who uh, massively uh, polluted and the judge found deliberately polluted uh, coastal waters and they were fined ninety nine oh million pounds. That is the first sort of serious fine that I've seen uh, against a water company. Uh, 20 million a few years ago against Thames Water. It wasn't even a day's, uh, a day's operating revenue. So, uh, you know, for, for big companies that do big damage, there have to be eye-wateringly big penalties. And, you know, actually in the worst cases, I, I, I don't think fines are appropriate. I think people should be sent to jail. So there's an issue about, you know, is there enough, uh, enough of a stick? In my view, no. Um, second thing I'll say is regulators should regulate and be given the tools to regulate. You know, it's not the environment, it's his job to, um, uh, to, to uh, run uh, a water company uh, or, or a farm uh, or, a, or a nuclear plant it is our job to, to regulate them to make sure that as far as possible they do not damage the environment. And uh, my learning is that where you have a robust regulatory framework with the right laws and the resources to uh, give effect to those laws, you get good results. I actually think to answer the question that by and large in this country, the overall regulatory framework is pretty good, largely because you know people have lobbied for it to be better. And I actually think that the EA has been pretty good at giving effect to it by and large over the last few years. But we do have a resource issue and you know, it's to be familiar to everyone on this call, our resources are going down. That is affecting our ability to know what's going on uh, and to intervene to stop bad behavior when we see it. So ultimately, again, it comes back to politics. We will get the environment we're prepared to pay for. Uh, and you know, that's, 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 that's the bottom line. Final point, I think this is a timely conversation and a timely question because post-Brexit and post-Covid, there's a really big debate starting about whether and if so, how we do want regulation in this country. There are people who say regulation is, uh, is, is a weight on business. And if we want to rebound economically, if we want to use the benefits of leaving the European Union, we need to take down all that red tape. I don't agree with that. Uh, red tape, the right red tape is what keeps people alive. It also keeps the country clean and green and provides justice. But there is a debate about, about that starting. And I think all of us, again, it gets back to agency. All of us should be part of that debate because I think we can make a difference to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do any of the other three panellists want to comment on that particular question? Shall I move on to a final? I want okay. to comment in terms of representation. I think that debate has to be inclusive. And how we purposefully facilitate that is really important. This is a, a time when we have a rising generation of multicultural voices, not just specifically ethnic minority people, also mixed race voices as well. And we also have many groups which are working with diverse communities who are white, who are making efforts to increase representation, but they are in touch. We need to gather everybody together who are in touch with these issues and join them together and facilitate and nurture more voices to come forward to support the advance into a better society in which regulation has a great role to play. We cannot do without regulation, but we need to talk about what it is, how it is done for it to be effective for people and for nature. Yeah, completely agree, Judy, thank you. Okay, we're going to finish off this Q&A with one, one last question, which is concerning the, the insights from the report. So I'm going to put this to, to everyone. So how will being more informed with this report enable positive change and improvements to parts of society worst affected by inequalities? So what can we all do and how can we use this report to start making those positive changes that we need to see quickly? Um, James, am I okay to go to you first? Sure, I was hoping you'd go to one of our other three uh, much more articulate uh, <laughs> representatives while I worked out what my answer was. Uh, but no, uh, thank you. Um, so look, I, I'm, uh, you know, there's, there, I don't quote Karl Marx a lot, but I will um, uh, this morning. He said, um, the point is not simply to understand the world, the point is to change it. 
Uh, and uh, I think what is, you know, what I'd say about the report that we're publishing today, and there are many others like this, is that if it just sits on the shelf as a way of understanding the world, then we'll have failed. But if it is a tool to help us understand the world in order to make it better, then we'll have succeeded. So I think the first thing I would say in terms of how we take this debate forward is we, we need to internalize the meaning of what the data and the anal analysis is telling us. You know, and we know, we've all said in the last hour, there are massive inequalities, health, um, wealth, uh, life chances, environmental in our society. Uh, we know they interact. Uh, we know the causes and actually we know the solutions. So I think the most important thing we can do from, from this report and the analysis is turn it into action. Uh, and we're trying to do that in the Environment Agency. We are trying to make sure that we don't get pushed into focusing on issues that, you know, well-off, well-educated, frankly, white middle-class communities try to get us into, that we try and get into the issues that are actually the most important, which tend not to be actually in environmental terms, the ones that, that we're being lobbied on. So I think there's a, there's a job for us as an agency to continue to hold ourselves to account in what we do and what we don't do. And there is a job for us, I think, to make sure that we do actually make sure that we reach out um, to those excluded communities in the ways that I was talking about and, and listen. I think, I mean, I think one of the great virtues of today is that we all listen to each other. I think people don't listen enough. So I think a lot of listening on the part of people like me and my organization will induce better understanding and that will enable us to do better action and deliver greater environmental justice. Thank you. Thank you, James. And um, we'll go to um, Kate and then Olivia and then finish off with Judy. Yes, I was hoping to buy some more time too. Very good question. Um, yeah, I think, I suppose we just need to mobilize around this agenda. Um, so I would say to everyone, wherever you're working, whatever you're doing, you know, take this on board and everywhere you go, let's talk about this sort of leveling up the inequalities alongside environmental justice. And, you know, this is how we move the issues into the mainstream. So they can't every, you know, the tipping point. So change inevitably happens. But I think sort of collective action, we're, we're stronger if we work together. I think that's been the problem. We haven't uh, come form alliances to push this forward. And really, if we take this focus on inequality, um, it will benefit everybody. Uh, that is a point, but we have, I completely agree with James, who we should, the focus should be on, and that should be our absolute priority. Cool, um, I'll go next then. Um, I think as, as James and Kate spoke to, it's great that inequality and justice was put at the center of this report and, and therefore it's becoming mainstream. It's talking about a lot of things that people have already known and already spoken about, but to get it in a report um, by a body like the Environment Agency is really important because that mean, means it's on the agenda. What I don't think we need to do is therefore have another report or something else about things that, as James has said, we know, we have known, we know what the problem is, we know what the solution is. So we don't need another version of this in a different guise. So I think that's a, that's a what not to do tip. <laughs> um, and then I think the what to do tip is, um, as Kate said, mobilize and not feel like we need to start from scratch on all of the points that have been highlighted in that report. Everything is going on already or at some scale. Um, we've just got to find it and connect it. And as Judy has spoken to so much, scale it up. So I feel like there's a lot that's covered in, in the report. Um, but it doesn't need to be overwhelming or scary because 60% of it is already being done in some, in some way. Um, so it's about having that realization of, I might not be doing it right now, but somebody else is, how can I, how can I help that? How can I lend the tools I have that they don't to making that, to making that better and more impactful? So I think, um, I think that's my answer. Thank you, Olivia. And, and finishing up with Judy. Well, I just really want to say to the Environment Agency, you know, you have really listened in order to produce a report like that. And you have empowered so many of us in so many different directions, because let's face it, we're an evidence obsessed world. And for you to supply us with a report from an authoritative institution to give us figures that we can quote, elements of directions that local authorities, institutions, the academic world, the community have to all move together to achieve something. 
it is a great, great thing to have. You have really brought together two of the most important infrastructural elements of our present time. These concerns are diversity, equality and inclusion as one, and the other, the urban environment. Very often in the past, when you talk about environment, it's also somewhere in the countryside, you know. But we are now saying the urban environment where people live is that vital connection that the Secretary General of the UN said, you know, the battle for sustainability will be won or fought, fought won or lost in the cities. And it's really true. If we don't have green in the city, our next generation won't connect with it. 80% of our population is here. So we need to build that base, that connection, that involvement, so that we have more and more citizens making for a very strong movement in the future for sustainable development. So really, thank you for this report. It's momentous, especially with COP26 on the, on the horizon. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Judy. High praise there, James. Would you like to say any closing words before we move on to the next session? Uh, well, uh, firstly, thank you to, to, to Judy and everybody. Obviously, um, this is not my credit, it's the credit of lots of other people in the Environment Agency and, and you and your colleagues with whom we've, we've worked. I guess I just wanted to pick up uh, Olivia's point because it's, it's been a bit of my philosophy too. You said at one point, Olivia, um, uh, it's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Uh, and I, I, I agree, I, I, you know, that, I, that's my philosophy too. I think we should you know, we should proceed until apprehended. You know, we know, we know, we know what the answers are. Let's just get on and do it. And and together we're much stronger. And I feel as a result of the last hour or so that we're, we're a lot stronger than we were. So thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sir James Bevan from the Environment Agency and our panelists, Olivia, Judy and Kate. Um, we're now going to move into our own listening session. So very shortly, you're all going to be put into small friendly breakout rooms um, to reflect on what we talked about today. Um, and you might even be lucky enough to be put in a breakout room with one of our speakers. Um, to avoid the initial awkwardness, we have created a discussion prompter um, that's in the chat. It's just a document with three questions on. And what we're interested to hear about is what struck a chord for you about um, the insights discussed today? What's missing or not focused on enough? Uh, and what are the important takeaways that we all need to share? And we're going to use um, the insights and thoughts that uh, you share with us to then put together a short digest that um, reflect the, the views in the room. Um, so just as in real life, if you end up in a room and it's not on topic or it's making you feel uncomfortable, you can always return to the main Zoom room. Um, there's also an ask for help function in the breakout room, and this is at the bottom of the screen. So it would be lovely to hear from, from Kate and Olivia as to the, the topics and the energy from your rooms. What, what particularly struck you? Can we start with Olivia? Yes, yes. Um, I apologise to my group. I had to nip away. So if I'm missing something that you covered, please do make sure you write it in, in the form so it's captured. Um, so a lot of our discussion... Elvis, who was in our group, um, has set up his own, or well, he's part of a kind of global movement, bringing people together to talk around, around clean air and how that links with public health. So, so he's based in the Cameroon. So this understanding that the awareness within the Cameroon is not necessarily aware of what's going on in the UK or elsewhere in the world. So bringing together a global network he's, he's, is really important to him at the moment. So that's one of the key things he's working on and, and just hearing what's going on um, elsewhere around the world has been really important for him and, and the need for compliance and that that carrot and stick discussion that we had with James earlier um, is was really key to him and, and again we had conversations around litter and again the frustration with what's important for the individual and what councils are able um, to do um, and, and different levels of engagement in your local area and how how to bring people together to sing from the same hymn sheet as much as possible. Individual Individuals want to do different things, but how we can be aiming to aiming for the same, the same green future, but maybe just going down different routes to get there and not necessarily blocking people off for, from their own path. So discussions around that. And I think people were just really grateful to be in a room um, that's had some lively discussions and new ideas and, and um, informed, informed discussions as well and, and be around um, bringing in the human element and the social element into environmental issues, um, I think I think was really important. Um, 
but I'm sure I've missed something. So please, please type away in the chat if I've if I've if I've miss miss summarised you. Thank you, Olivia. Um, great. And Kate, what about you? What struck you from the conversations in your room? Yes, thank you. We had some great conversations. Um, Beverly from Re London, uh, she's um, was particularly struck, I think, just finding out about all the different projects that was going on and just found that very inspiring and then thinking how she's going to link that to her own work. Uh, really. She's working on sort of ultra low waste neighbourhoods uh, in London. So sort of joining that up in a really practical way and really welcomed uh, the whole event really for that sort of holistic approach. Um, we talked a lot about sort of language as well. And I think that was um, echoing some of the points that Olivia and Judy had raised. So perhaps using health as a starting point rather than saying environmental or climate. And again, go to where you know there's not a sense of hard to reach communities people are there you know <laughs> it, you just go to where they're at if you want to engage so it's just shifting that and it was very much the idea of wanting to link, link up more with the grassroots and really make it conscious effort to do that um we talked a lot um with ben as well that using sort of food as a starting point is a really great way to sort of connect with people uh, particularly in urban areas and that uh, connection because um, everyone eats you know and you know you can sort of celebrate as well using food and then talk about other issues from there um, we didn't have a sense of what we would like to see more of because they were happy with the, the whole uh, event um, and yeah the takeaway message was sort of um, trying to work more sort of collectively and linking up with people fantastic thank you Kate Yes, exciting to hear all of the different projects that are happening everywhere, even within the rooms and, and from the speakers today. So thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the end of this, this event. Um, big thank you to all of those who are still with us on Zoom. Uh, well done, it's a long slog, I know. Um, and thank you for contributing such brilliant questions. Um, a massive thank you to our speakers. So Sir James Bevan from the Environment Agency, Judy Ling Wong from the Black Environment Network, at Kate Metcalf from the Women's Environmental Network and Olivia Sweeney from Black and Green Ambassadors. So thank you to you. Um, and of course, um, to the team behind the scenes, the tech and the organization crew. So Will Murray from the Environment Agency for all his work and my super gap colleagues, Ben, Sonia, Hannah, James and everyone else squirreled away. So thank you everyone. Um, it's been a wonderful event and let's all go out and shout and talk as much as we can about these links between environmental issues and social inequalities and the need to address them. Thank you very much.